Um, yes, I'm not Emma McCall, uh, I'm David Vale. Um, I've stepped in as a, a substitute uh, for her. Emma is stuck in Australia, she couldn't be here today, but um, she's uh, one of the key brains behind this operation. I'm, I obviously just bring the brawn, um, so hopefully I'll be a useful substitute. Um, today I'm going to be talking about um, designing a decision support system uh, to inform farm management with particular reference to sea lice uh, treatments uh, in the west of Scotland. Um, so I'm a consultant, an environmental consultant for BMT. Um, BMT is an international design, engineering, technology and risk management consultancy. Um, our core strengths are maritime design consultancy, asset monitoring and sustainment and environment and climate solutions, as well as defence. It's the first three of these that, that form part of this, of, of the project I'm going to talk about today. Um, this project has been a collaboration between our Australian offices in Perth, Brisbane uh, and Melbourne and our, our UK offices which are based in London and Aberdeen and in Leeds as well. Um, so this project has been carried out under the uh, uh, um, Seafood Innovation Fund which is uh, funded by CFAS. Um, and the purpose of it is to look into uh, innovative uh, research and development to support the UK seafood aquaculture and um, fisheries industries. Um, we first of all conducted a six month feasibility study which was carried out around uh, the back second half of 2020. Um, that was carried out fairly successfully and we've moved on to the, the full development schedule which we hope to, to complete within about an 18 month cycle starting in September and finishing hopefully in next March. Um, we're some at the moment operating between uh, sections two and, th two and three there we're refining our hydrodynamic and biological models um, and then starting to develop scenarios within them. Um, the scenario management is fair, the, the, the scenario management is key. And we really are looking for input from industry and, and research uh, because that, that's, that's how we're going to get these models to the, to the best possible use. Um, we want them to, to, to be something that can be used uh, actively and dynamically by the industry. Um, and what we're doing here is using existing models within a management structure to create a tool that industry can just use. Uh, the Seafood uh, Innovation Fund has six uh, main objectives, which we hope this project will, will, be, will be able to tick off. Uh, sustainability, innovation, productivity, collaboration, uh, management, and reduction of risk uh, to the industry. Uh, the decision support system will be supported by BMT Deep. Um, this is a, a cloud-based platform which can store, manage and um, process uh, huge quantities of data and it's the project of 20 years uh, experience in the field by, by scientists and, and engineers within BMT. You can see a couple of uh, characters from our Australian office there using it in, in some sort of, uh, in anger there uh, for some sort of fish fish farm out, I think, in the Kimberley region, perhaps. Um, we're looking to develop data-driven decision-making tools to support sustainable aquaculture. We've got our wheel of, of items there uh, that, that, that input into the, uh, into the management system. We'll look at that again a little bit later. So the decision support system has uh, six aims. Um, we're looking to develop collaborative solutions with industry, with academia, and with regulators. Um, we aim, we hope that this can be used to reduce cumulative impacts both between uh, aquaculture um, farm, between farms and also between uh, aquaculture and other users of the sea environment. Uh, we hope to be able to help design effective sea lice treatment schedules that minimize environmental impact, lower treatment costs, reduce losses of production, um, and also bring benefits to animal welfare within the industry. Um, so, looking at the, the, the development of, first of all, our, um, um, our base model. Um, this mesh, you can see over to the west of Scotland, is our lower resolution model mesh. Um, resolution of this is about four kilometers, and it's uniform across the whole, the whole mesh. Um, we can overlay our physical factors, salinity, temperature, depth, um, and water currents, met-ocean conditions onto this. You can see there's, uh, there's water depth overlaid onto it. Um, we've then split the area into five uh, high-resolution zones closer to the coast of Scotland. 
Um, the reason for splitting it into five is to make it manageable. The hydrodynamics within the lochs around the west coast of Scotland are extremely complicated, and to, to make these things manageable from a time and processing uh, perspective, they're split into separate units. The units have been decided based on um, connectivity studies of infection between farms. Um, so there, you can see the first model. If there's any Scottish sailors, they might quibble about some of the names that we've picked, but that's uh, all up for negotiation. This is our northwest model up here, and you can see where the, the high resolution and the low resolution models interact. Um, the hydrodynamics from the low resolution model have been used to force a boundary condition. Um, the low resolution model scales down to approximately 50 meters uh, at the, the nearer the coast where the farms are located. There's our, our sky model um, around the Isle of Skye. Loch Linney, uh, which is the region that uh, John was just talking about. And that's our, that's our sorry, Loch Linney is our base uh, model, the one we've used to, to really push, push through, the, the, develop this, these, these, this work. The Firth Clyde model down at its end by Glasgow and the Minch up there. So there's the whole high resolution area. And there, you can see there's quite a bit of overlap between uh, the, the five models, or at least the four northern models. Um, each farm will only appear within the domain that it's most suited to based on that connectivity study. They won't be replicated several times in a wider model. So there, there's, there's our high resolution model with C velocity on, uh, current velocity on, up to approximately two meters per second. And there's our Loch Linney model, uh, the higher resolution there with a bit more detail. Um, visible. So, integrating the, the model development and the sea lice, uh, validating the sea lice model. Uh, there are two stages to this. The first stage was uh, conducted as part of the six month feasibility study about a year ago. And we were looking to dem demonstrate that our biological model uh, fulfilled the following basic behavior and response patterns of, of sea lice in, in the field. Um, so we've got the, the daily vertical migration towards sunlight. Um, we've got a maturation response. We've got a response to salinity with lice moving away from freshwater inputs towards more saline solutions. And we've also got a mortality rate in there. Stage two, which is where we are now, um, is to compare the observed, the observations within the field to our model outputs and see where, how, how, how accurate the models, the models are proving. Um, we're looking for seasonal variation within clusters, um, areas of high risk and low risk, um, as well as treatment practices, um, responses, and reducing the, the uncertainty with treatment in the field. So, uh, sorry, that, the, the blue blobs on that, uh, that diagram, on that, on that figure there to the, to the right, uh, sea lice counts from farms as reported in 2021. Um, so if we move on a slide, this is use of uh, the treatment. Um, I forgot what treatment it is, but that's by the by. Uh, this is actually 2020. The results aren't directly comparable, but I think there's the, the question, or a question you can you can take from this is: Is there a correlation there between high sea lice and high treatment use, or is there an inverse correlation between high treatment use, consequently low sea lice, and hopefully? use of these models can, and, and management systems can maybe pick apart some of those, those knottier questions. So here's an example of, of, of what the system might look like as outputs um, based on a fish waste model. Um, so on the, the top left there, you've got um, a, a schematic showing how the various inputs uh, come together to create, to create the outputs. We've got a mock-up on the right of uh, information provided by a, an imaginary farm, uh, fish waste, um, food inputs. Um, what else have we got? Biomass in there. And then we've got some outputs there on the bottom left. Uh, and that's waste, dispersal of waste around the base of, a, of, of, of cages. I believe this is somewhere in, in Western Australia again at these outputs. So the, the model approach in summary We've got a 3D hydrodynamic model of the wider Loch Linney region. We can add on top of that uh, a particle track tracking model of uh, sea lice larvae um, and their dispersal and infestation. Um, we can model particular scenarios to assess treatment regimes 
and potentially other, other, other items, and then we can create graphical output of those model scenarios. Looking in a bit more detail at our sea lice model, um, we've got, uh, the model is capable of uh, dealing with up to 10 life stages. However, for the purposes of this, we've just looked at two, the pre-infectious nuclei stage uh, and the post-infectious co copepoidal stage. Um, and maturation between these two stages is uh, temperature linked as various people, Margarita and, uh, and John have, have mentioned already today. Um, and you can see on the graphs there at, at, at the bottom, um, there's a temperature dependent choice of three uh, functions uh, fitted to experimental data. And you can see there that the time larvae, uh, the time that the, the lice spend within each stage um, decreases with increasing temperature, as, as you'd expect. Um, salinity, swim speed has been set so that uh, lice swim to avoid low salinity and stop swimming when they reach minimum salinity. They don't swim towards minimum salinity. And then daily vertical migration. They respond to a vertical, uh, they, they respond to a light trigger to swim upwards at daytime, as we know they do in, 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 in real life. 17% um, per time step mortality drop-off has been added as well. Um, and this has been tested on a four-cell rectangular grid and the idealized West uh, wider Lochlinny model. Uh, there's an, uh, a sort of depiction of it at the top there of the slide. So the, the vertical uh, resolution uh, is one meter within the photic zone, dropping down to about 20 meters outside the photic zone. So that allows us to build the, the daily migration through the water column into this model. And these, these, these functions can be added dynamically into the model. So there's, there's a schematic just, just summarizing uh, what the, the model inputs. We've got current driving life's movement. We've got migration towards sunlight and away from fresh water. We've got the mat maturation temperature dependent between the, the two stages. Uh, and we've got a, we've got a drop off due to mortality. Um, so the next stage, having done all that, the next stage is, is scenario modeling. Uh, modeling scenarios specific to farms and practices and treatment regimes. Um, and this is where we really uh, are looking for industry input. Um, we can see a, a mock-up on the right there of uh, sea lice counts related to dose of, of, of um, treatment. Uh, unsurprisingly, at the maximum dose, the counts are a fair bit lower than at zero dose. But there's all sorts of other factors in play, cumulative impacts, um, location, timing of, of, of application. Um, so we're, we're looking for comparis comparisons, comparative analysis to compare uh, treatment practices and schedules and regimes and see what works best for particular operators, particular locations, particular farms. Um, we can run three-month seasonal simulations. The, uh, the models take about four weeks, I think, to, to warm up. Uh, get themselves uh, all, all, all up and running with the various uh, hydrodynamic f features. And the, the seasons that have been picked were autumn and spring uh, 2021. Um, those were picked on, on, on um, advice from, uh, from industry as, as critical uh, periods for farm management and farm production. Um, so then we can look to develop our scenarios. We want to make sure that our calibrated models are fit for purpose for whatever the scenario is, um, and then we can refine our mesh to suit a particular, the specific location of whatever farm we're, we're looking at at a given time. So we're back, back to this slide, um, our characters in Australia and our uh, wheel there, and looking at it in a bit more detail, the inputs we've got, met ocean uh, data, uh, met ocean data, so temperature, wind, water currents, um, Structural integrity, information provided likely by the operator, quality of water, a farm operation schedule, um, forecast modeling. There's the potential for various other applications we can, we, can, we can look into forecasting. We've actually got a poster out there looking at uh, sea surface temperature um, and how that can perhaps be used to inform um, decisions in, in the years ahead based on predicted sea surface temperatures and then um, production and, and how the um, cost-benefit analysis and how the food, the food, um, the food chain and, and, 
and supply models can be used to optimize these, uh, these, these outputs. So the project steering group, uh, apart from BMT, it comprises um, Scottish Sea Farms, who are our industry support, and they've been extremely helpful, providing a lot of data and a lot of advice to us. Um, they're one of Scotland's biggest uh, salmon producers. Marine Scotland Science, um, Maeve and Sandy, who've turned up in the nick of time, um, have provided have been invaluable with their support. Uh, they've had got 20 years of experience developing models, and they've they've, they've helped us uh, hugely. And SEPA, who are the, the regulatory body um, looking at uh, at aquaculture in Scotland, we've also got various project partners and stakeholders, a range of um, consultancies, um, universities, um, and and regulator, regulatory bodies who've all input into this project. Um, and finally. We're, we're taking a lot of data, or we're asking for a lot of data for, from industry, from academia, and we're very keen to, to have it. Um, but we are aware there's, uh, there's issues of commerciality and confidence. So there are, there are levels of data streams. There's, there's items that can be put out for public dissemination um, to inform, and, and, to inform and, and inform research. Um, but there's also commercial and confidence data, which can be kept internally. Uh, this isn't about publicizing people's data. Um, so that's all I've got to say. Thank you very much for, for allowing us to speak at the conference and for listening. And uh, if you've got any questions, I can either I can have a go at answering them or I can refer them back to the real experts uh, in the Australia office. Thank you very much. <laughs>